Here we go. From the frozen foothills of North Carolina, it is the Confirmed Epic Podcast, the official podcast of the EpicReview.com. I, of course, am the real Brad Bell, and joining me today, as always, is Jerry Reed, also known as Barbecue17. All right, Jerry, we're going to dedicate this episode to two things, two very epic things. Spider-Man, one of my all-time favorite characters, and Toy Fair 2015. Toy Fair 2014 podcast is one of our most popular shows of last year. So we're going to dedicate an entire show to it this year. But before we get into that, let's get into the epic news of this week, which is, of course, Spider-Man, the character being shared by Sony and by Disney. So in case you are living under a rock, here's the news. After the Sony hack, after a ton of leaks that... Sony may sell the Spider-Man, talking about the cinematic version of the character, back to Marvel, back home to now Disney, Marvel Studios, so he could team up with the Avengers and all the characters in their cinematic library. A deal was reached in the dead of the night, because it did hit about midnight last week, that they were going to co-distribute the character. So in other words... Spider-Man can now appear in Marvel Studio films, and Marvel Studios characters can now appear in uh, Sony Spider-Man films, although Sony has final say over the character. Uh, now, this is up right up there with Disney buying Star Wars. I mean, to be able to get, not control, but to add Spider-Man to their library, the possibilities are limitless when it comes to storytelling. With this news, we also found out they will be recasting Spider-Man. Andrew Garfield is out. And even more surprisingly, this deal didn't cost either studio a penny. Alright, so Sony keeps all their profits from their solo Spider-Man movies. And Marvel Studios keeps all their profits for any Marvel movies that Spider-Man is in. So Jerry, I know you're not the biggest Spider-Man character in the world, uh, excuse me, Spider-Man fan. You're not the biggest Spider-Man character in the world. You're definitely That's not a character, no. But we, uh, we should maybe write you in. You would probably say you'll be more interesting than half the characters in the Spider-Man <laughs> universe. But you're not the biggest Spider-Man fan in the world. But what did you think when this news broke? I was pretty excited. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I guess I really, I do like Spider-Man. I think the thing is he's just not one of my top. He's not even in my top ten favorite superheroes. But he's probably you know, like, the most recognizable in America behind Superman and Batman. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I was, uh, I was, you know, living in an orphanage in Mexico when the original Spider-Man film hit, the Sam Raimi, yeah, uh, first one. And I mean, Spider-Man was huge. We were down in, you know, throughout Mexico and, and doing some work down there. And, and I mean, you know, this is back in 2002, and I mean, Spider-Man was massive. He has, he has huge international popularity, and is you know really recognizable all over the place. So I was pretty excited. I think if there's somebody that's going to make me get really interested in Spider-Man again, it's going to be the way that Marvel Studios handles it, and it's going to be seeing Spider-Man interact with you know all of the other established Marvel Studios characters. That I'm really familiar with. Well, as much as I love uh, the Sam Raimi first two Spider-Man movies, and I didn't hate Amazing Spider-Man 2 as much as some people, I don't think anyone has 100% nailed the Spider-Man character on screen the way that Marvel Studios has Iron Man or the way that uh, even Warner Brothers and Heath Ledger did uh, with the Joker in 2008 with the Dark Knight. It's just we have the Tobey Maguire version, which is great at portraying the Peter Parker, the struggles, the angst, 
you know, the kind of neurotic superhero type. And then we have the Andrew Garfield, who's great into Spider-Man with the quips and things like that. But then again, Toby wasn't great in the suit, and Andrew Garfield wasn't the best Peter Parker. So nobody has really nailed the character from a direction or performance standpoint. So now that Marvel has the character, I'm a lot more hopeful that that can happen. So, uh, you know... I'm really interested that it seems that Marvel Studios is going with a, you know, high school-aged Spider-Man. That was my next question for you is, they have decided, or at least the rumor is, they're going to go with a high school-aged Spider-Man. Now, that means they're going to cast somebody 23 years old to play high school, right? Absolutely. But what do you think about that? Do you like that? It's going to be an interesting dynamic because you already have... You know, the, the Avengers cast is uh, is a bit older. I mean, some of them are, 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 you know, definitely older than your traditional superhero. So you have a really established cast of characters, and then you bring in somebody like Spider-Man, who's kind of this young upstart. And it seems like there could definitely be some, some room for interesting conflicts and good interaction between the characters. It also allows Marvel Studios to potentially have an actor that could continue playing Spider-Man. You know, let's say these let's say these actors hang around for another few years and then decide, you know, to move on to other things. Well, if you have a younger Spider-Man, that character and that actor can kind of anchor, you know, another wave of incoming characters. And it would be kind of cool to see him move Let's assume that he, this guy, whoever's playing Spider-Man, which we don't know yet, is going to be around for a decade or 12 years, like Robert Downey Jr. has been with the Iron Man character. It will be fun to actually see him come of age in mm-hmm. real life and on the screen. You know, you have a high school movie, then you have a college movie, then you have a grad school movie, then you have a movie where he is moved on and getting married to. So to see him grow up, would be cool, and I think you bring up an interesting point where you have all these older characters, and then you throw a high schooler in the mix, a high schooler that nobody's seen, a smart-ass high schooler, and it could get really interesting in there. But I was on the opposite end of the spectrum because I was like, is it going to be a little off-putting, or is it going to fit to see, or is it going to be believable I use believable, that term loosely here in this fantastical superhero world, to have a 16-year-old, you know, matching wits with uh, Robert Downey Jr. And I I, I thought they they would opt for an older Spider-Man when I first heard it, but it seems that's not going to be the case now. They even confirmed that this is Peter Parker, that they're not going to try to use... Miles Morales. Yeah, that is the confirmation, and that kind of brings me into the next uh, part of our conversation. I made a list of top five next Spider-Man, and it was a dream list. I knew half the names on this list would never happen and or whatnot, but I went ahead and made it anyway for the EpicReview.com. And uh, two of the people on my list were Miles Morales, Spider-Man. I'm going to run through this list really quick, Jerry, right here, okay, All right. if you don't mind. All no, right. works for me. Top five potential Spider-Man. You can find this on our site at theepicreview.com. I'll go from fifth to first. I said for a high school age Spider-Man, I like Josh Hutcherson of Hunger Games. I know, Jerry, you hadn't seen the Hunger Games but I thought he would be a decent high school age Spider-Man. For an older Peter Parker, at number four, I had Jake Gyllenhaal. All right, he was rumored a long time ago to kind of pick up the mantle from uh, Tobey Maguire and uh, continue that franchise, but we know they rebooted it with Andrew Garfield. And number three, the prodigal son returns, uh, Tobey Maguire. And I said, please bring back J.K. Uh, Simmons, or Simons, rather, as J. Jonah Jameson. I know that would be convoluted. I know that would take a lot of retconning. 
But, man, he's 39, but he always looks like he's 23 years old, don't he? Toby now, I'd be okay with him bringing Toby McGuire back. And I, and I, you're a big Sam Raimi fan. You're a big fan of camp, campy stuff, camp humor, whatever. And I would just, you know, the Marvel movies are pretty serious. Not as serious as a lot of what DC's doing, but they're pretty, at least somewhat grounded. And they seem to be going even further in that direction with Age of Ultron. But to kind of have that light camp where you still don't jeopardize, you know, any stakes. I think having a Sam Raimi, Sam Raimi type film within that context would be kind of a good mixture in there, you know? It would, it would help separate Spider-Man from the other characters, you know, tonally. That That's one of the things. I don't want to jump off in too much of a tangent. It's all right. And I don't, I don't think I said this. I may have said this on the last podcast, but, you know, watching the Ant-Man trailer... You know, it, it doesn't look bad, but there's nothing in there yet that's a hook. You know, that's that's really got me roped in, other than the fact that it's a Marvel Studios film. It seems like it's going to, you know, it's going to be at least a good movie, three, three and a half out of five, and it's going to follow the Marvel Cinematic Universe kind of formula that every movie, with the exception of Guardians, Captain America, The Winter Soldier, and The Avengers has followed, right? Yeah. But, you know, a lot of the more recent Marvel films have kind of had, you know, when you saw the trailer for Guardians of the Galaxy, you're automatically like, okay, this is going to be, you know, a little bit of reverence, going to use, you know, 70s pop music. It it has a a feel that you can already grasp that kind of separates it from the rest of the superhero movies. Even Captain America, Winter Soldier, when you start seeing stuff about it, you know, sort of had, okay, the whole political thriller, and, you know, it kind of forged its own identity. I don't think Ant-Man has done that yet, you know, with the trailers. Uh, but if Spider-Man did use, you know, a little bit different type of humor or style, like you mentioned, it'd be a good way that when you see the trailer, when you start seeing the marketing for the film, to suddenly say, oh, okay, this, you know, here's a here's a tone, a different tone for the film. Here's a hook that I can, you know, you can kind of, get caught up on. And Spider-Man does need to uh, stand out from the rest of the Marvel catalog. He really does. I mean, say what you want to. X-Men, Iron Man, Cap, whatever. Spider-Man, even though he wasn't the first, that was Fantastic Four. He is the flagship Marvel character. And he needs to stand out. I'm not saying he needs to lead an Avengers team because that's never been his role. You know, when it comes to team, he kind of just blends in and plays a very good teammate. But I think bringing Toby back would give some gravitas to the role. I can totally see a very smart Toby Maguire, Peter Parker, uh, matching wits with Mark Ruffalo's Bruce Banner, or Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man, and I could see that being believable. Whereas if I see a high school age character, such as right now they have two people rumored... uh, Dylan O'Brien and Logan Learman, one of the guys is from Maze Runner, the other one that plays Percy Jackson. Those are two people that are rumored. I don't know if I'm buying it. Now, again, I, I put faith in Marvel Studios, but you brought up my biggest shocker, Jerry, of this whole story since I've been following it, and I've been following it really closely, is they will be going with Peter Parker. Now, that doesn't mean Peter Parker is going to be white, but we could assume that he would be white. And it looks like Donald Glover, my number two pick, is playing Miles Morales, and my dream pick of Michael B. Jordan, who actually is playing the Human Torch at number one to play Miles Morales, are all out. What do you think about their choice to say, we're going with Peter Parker just right away. And does that necessarily mean that Peter Parker is going to be white? Well, I will speak to you. One of the things I think would be interesting with, with Miles Morales is that you are adding some diversity to the, to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And you're doing it in a way that's not just superficial by saying we're taking an established character and just, you know changing their race or ethnicity. Yeah. Um, Miles Morales has a different background. He has a different backstory. 
And not only does it add more diversity, but it gives us something we haven't seen before with a Spider-Man character. You exactly. Know? That We've was... seen Peter Parker's... Um, origin story. I mean, story. Peter Parker's origin story has been in a part of pretty much every Spider-Man film that's come out. I know the the Amazing Spider-Man, you know, changed it a bit, but still, we've seen that character's origin story. Miles Morales would give us something different while still having, you know, a traditional, fairly traditional-looking Spider-Man. Yeah, it would, uh, we could tell an origin story without feeling origin story burnout, because he does have completely different powers. A lot of them are similar. He does have a different background, both et- ethnically and even just from a narrative standpoint, you know, and I do think that would be interesting. And uh, this came up, you know, Donald Glover, who's from Community, who plays Troy on Community, has been waging a campaign to get to play Spider-Man strongly ever since they cast Andrew Garfield. So there's a lot of people out there that would like to see him at least come in and audition for the role. And I'm not going to assume anything that Peter Parker is going to be necessarily going to be white, but... I mean, just reading the tea leaves, I think that's the direction it's going, especially when they're talking to two white actors, Logan Learman and Dylan O'Brien, to play play this role. Uh, I know that you, um, I don't know if either one of us were the biggest fans of the Amazing Spider-Man franchise, but do you think that Andrew Garfield kind of got a, got a raw deal here. I mean, I know he made his money and whatnot, but he seemed to really enjoy playing the character. No, I mean, he did. He was, a. Uh, I thought he was really good as, as Spider-Man, you know, when he was in the costume. Um, I mean, part of it was, I just think the movies were, were a mess. Each mm-hmm. one of them was a mess. They felt very 90s Joel Schumacher, didn't they? I don't even know if, I don't well, even know if I would did. put it, I don't know even know if I would put it at that as much as there just was so much going on that they didn't focus on anything well. Mm-hmm. They just were jumping all over the place. There was they 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 dawdled in areas that weren't interesting and they just skipped over far too much stuff that could have been more interesting. Well, they 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 tried to sit up so much stuff. I mean, from the get-go, you're telling an origin story but the main point of your origin story is to sit up mysteries about Peter Parker's parents, who have, ne- let's face it, Aunt May and Uncle Ben are Peter Parker's parents. Yes, you know, his, his mother and father have been mentioned, they have been a part of storylines, but never some huge mystery surrounding their death. You know, I'm not saying not to be innovative with the stories you tell, because you do want to vary from the comics a bit. But there is kind of a, a blueprint and a playbook to kind of go by. And if you follow that, I'm not saying shot for shot or page for page, but you are going to get the essence of the character, and you're going to end up making a majority of the people overwhelmingly happy. I think that's what made the Nolan Batman movies so good, because as much as they were their own thing, the characters, the essence of those characters stay true to pretty much what they were in the comics and things like Batman, the animated series, and like Mm. that. But I read an article on comic book resources, and they were talking about why the Amazing Spider-Man failed. And it was all the things that we've been talking about. But one of them was uh, the Peter Parker character. They made the point that Garfield was a great in-the-suit Spider-Man. But Peter Parker is a character who starts out as a loner type nerd. All right, then he, he uh, while being Spider-Man, he gains confidence to kind of grow up and transition from that loner type nerd into, you know, a confident grad student and then to a guy that eventually, he's still always neurotic, but he marries a supermodel and he kind of gets his, you know, footing underneath him, so to speak. Or his webbing underneath him. Maybe that's a better way to put it. But uh, the Andrew Garfield character was too cool from the get-go. And the Tobey Maguire character, I'm talking about the version of Peter Parker here, not Spider-Man, never kind of took that step to mature, to grow up, 
to become that more confident Peter Parker. You see where I'm going with that, Jerry? Yeah, no, no, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying, yeah. So uh, you look at Andrew Garfield's version of the character. He comes in uh, riding skateboards and pretty, you know, in with the cool kids at school, you know. So I don't know. I just think they kind of botched the Peter Parker character. And, you know, you can argue with the character. And I'm still in this line from Andrew Stokes, and I know he would say this if he was here. And Spider-Man is his favorite character. Watch Young Justice. Yeah, oh. well, besides Watch Another Young line. Justice. Another line you're stealing. There's okay. a, let's take Batman. Both of our, well, Batgirl's your favorite character. But Batman, as far as the big heroes, he's probably both of our favorite characters. You can debate who is the true identity over Batman and Bruce Wayne, right? Is it Batman? Is he really Batman, or is Bruce Wayne a disguise for Batman, or is Batman a disguise for Bruce Wayne? That can be argued, right? Absolutely. Okay. With Spider-Man, there's no doubt he is Peter Parker. All right, Peter Parker, his life, his love story, his financial problems, his family problems are the essence of the Spider-Man character. And putting on that suit, that mask, and that web slinging is a relief, a, a release, a relief, whatever you want to call it, and kind of an outlet for him to uh, mature as a man and grow up outside of the suit, even when he's in the suit. And I just don't think that any studio has, has quite nailed that story. I mean, I think the 1990s, animated, say what you want to, it's not up there with Batman the Animated Series, but the 90s... It's pretty good, though. Yeah, if you go, and it's not on Netflix anymore, unfortunately, and there had not been a wide DVD release, but that 90s Spider-Man cartoon really has been the best as far as on-screen outlet to nail that, that this guy struggles as a, as a college student and a high school student. And Spider-Man is the outlet for that. So, I don't know. I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to follow the cast of news. I'm really excited. I think Spider-Man has come home. And I, I think they're going to handle the Peter Parker character and the Spider-Man character very uh, reverently. The only thing that makes me a bit afraid is that uh, kind of subtext of Sony has final say over the character. Yeah. You know? Lot, lots of skateboarding scenes, apparently. I just can't get over that. I, <laughs> I With the uh, first Amazing Spider-Man, Andrew Stokes and I, who are probably the biggest Spider-Mans of all of our geek friends, biggest Spider-Man fans, rather, went to see that. And everybody loved it and was talking about how it was superior over the first two Raimi films. We all know the third Raimi film sucks. And we were just like, what in the world? And I ended up seeing that movie three times in theaters to convince myself, yeah, it's all right. And then I watched it on DVD, and I'm like, this is crap. But I don't know. Maybe this incarnation can even get you interested, Jerry, in uh, your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. So that's going to wrap up our conversation about the webhead. Let's go ahead and move into Toy Fair 2015 discussion. So, Jerry, you're our resident toy fair, all things action figure expert, anyhow. So, once you give the general audience kind of overview of what New York Toy Fair actually is? Absolutely. So, so New York Toy Fair is really a trade show. You know, it's not like San Diego Comic Con or New York Comic Con or, or some kind of event that is intended to, you know, cater to fans. Um, it, it's really, it really caters to buyers. You know, this is where people like, you know, Walmart, Target, Toys R Us, Amazon, Kmart. That's where, you know, these buyers show up and um, decide, you know, what they're going to purchase for the next year. Uh, so this is a lot of of, of pitches and marketing uh, going on here. But, um, you know, I would say since the mid-90s, when you started having, you know, McFarlane toys and Kenner got back into Star Wars, you've really started having 
uh, collectors' magazines and publications get involved. And now you do have a lot of press coverage from, uh, you know, various, uh, you know, nerd news and media outlets. So it really is a huge time. This is where we see a lot of toys. I would say we see more new stuff here than we see at San Diego Comic-Con. For collectors, in a way, it's like Christmas in February, because even though you're not tangibly holding the goods, you're looking every day as kind of a new reveal from a new major toy company. And even if you're not going to buy the stuff, you're like, oh, I would love to have that. And it's just kind of that thrill of getting up in the morning and looking on your computer and see what Mattel or Hasbro or DC Collectibles is going to reveal today. I mean, I really look forward to those walkthroughs that they do on sites like Toy News Eye and The Floosh and things like that. And we even have some, we've covered Toy Fair a lot in the past and a little bit this year. So, Jerry, uh, what we're going to do here is we kind of have our top 10 products. Maybe you've done it a little bit more based on line, because I know you're pretty knowledge, knowledgeable on action figure lines. So, um, Jerry, I, I'll let you start out the list. What product or line do you want to start out discussing? All right. Well, I just want to start with some real basic things. I, I thought this was a really good toy fair. Um, in, in some years past, you know, there's 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 been some years where there's been a lot of great stuff shown. There's been some that were a little bit blah, and even this year where there was there was nothing new for collectors with Star Wars nothing. from Hasbro. There was nothing. There was no new Black Series figures shown. Um, Hasbro just had a terrible showing. If you've been following anything with Hasbro and their, you know, their traditional Star Wars line right now, I mean, collectors are just frustrated. We can't even find the figures. You know, you have Rebels, the TV show that's going right now, and you cannot find the action figures. Not because they're not being sold, but because they're just not shipping. Um, Hasbro also did nothing with G.I. Joe this year, and they even kind of said in advance they weren't planning on doing anything for G.I. Joe. But even with no Star Wars, no G.I. Joe, this was a really good toy fair. So I've got my list numbered from 10 to 1 as well. Um, well so real quick, I think real we quick. could just start and talk about... Before we, before we get to our top 10 list, because you and I kind of were discussing uh, the, the Hasbro, the Star Wars stuff... And yes, it was a very poor showing for them, but you have to wonder, are they kind of holding back for The Force Awakens? Are they holding back to reveal at Celebration our San Diego Comic-Con? Or are they just don't know what they're doing over there right now with those it lines? It sounds like for The Force Awakens stuff, they're definitely holding back, but there's been a, a real lack of, of good you know, product for, for a few years now. Um, yeah. And it all goes back to when episode one got re-released in 3D. Retailers, the rumor is that retailers were told this was a new film, a new Star Wars film, not a re-release. <laughs> and so retailers ordered, um, you know, in huge numbers for episode one and at some places, like we have a couple Walmarts near us, there are still figures from this Episode 1 re-release from early 2012 sitting on the shelves. That's true, true, yeah. So I, I think that there is kind of a mismanagement when it comes to the overall line and when it comes to, like you said, G.I. Joe type products, which you're more knowledgeable in that area than I am. But I think for The Force Awakens... They will come out strong this summer, revealing some stuff. And hopefully that launch, which is supposed to be August, right? August or September? Yeah, uh, I think I think September is what we've heard. Well, Late August or September. Hopefully that launch will go smooth, and hopefully they will not limit the figures, because you want to be able to find them, but not overproduce characters that nobody wants, like they did with that episode one. A 3D release. But anyway, enough about Star Wars. I can't believe I'm saying that. All right, let's get into our list. Go ahead, Jerry. You're number 10. Okay. 
Well, one of the figures that I put on my best of 2014 was NECA did what was called the Ultimate Freddy Krueger. It was a Freddy Krueger action figure that had, you know, from the first film, multiple heads. It came in one of those nice, you know, boxes that NECA's been doing with a lot of their, uh, you know, their video game figures. They are releasing an Ultimate Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I'm not the biggest Texas Chainsaw Massacre fan, but I'm a huge fan of horror action figures. And the last Texas Chainsaw Massacre Leatherface figure I own is the old McFarlane version from the Movie Maniacs first series. So I'm really excited about this. I guess for me personally lately, I have really come to you know latch on to this saying that's near a favorite barbecue restaurant of mine, which says, quality remains long after price is forgotten. And I've definitely latched onto that lately. And, um, you know, I, I love getting an action figure. Sure, I may pay $25, $30 for it, but I love getting a figure where I feel like I don't have any regrets. And so NECA seems to really be, um, you know, delivering on something that I'm, I'm wanting by offering what these ultimate figures where they include lots of accessories, you know, alternate portraits. It's, uh, the figures are just well done and they come in a really nice collector box. Well, it's the, they offer you the definitive version of the character where you don't have to go back and be like, well, I would like to have the leather face from this scene or that scene. And to do that for them is a big step because, yeah, they can always produce stuff, but a lot of collectors, one Leatherface figure will be enough, especially if it's a, the, the definitive version. So that really is quality over quantity of figures they can sell you. Uh, I, I'm a big Texas Chainsaw fan. Uh, I'm excited for this figure. I won't be picking it up probably, but uh, this is actually one film. I go ahead. I'm blasphemous i like the remake better than the original actually so but my number 10 if you don't mind moving on is from okay. hasbro and it's two uh hasbro spider-man figures so i'm kind of cheating here and lumping two in but it is the craven figure craven the hunter that hasbro uh showed from their marvel legends line and rhino and uh, these look like big step-ups from previous Marvel Legends figures. I know you have some like Black Widow and Black Cat that are always up there, kind of um, upper echelon. But they look more like uh, Diamond Select figures. I mean, that Marvel Legends Rhino looks just as good as the Diamond Select Rhino. So to be able to pick that up for what you would assume would be 20 bucks at a Walmart or a Target, maybe 22 bucks. I think that's a steal, and I think it's a big step up in quality for that line. Did you check out those figures? I did. I was going to say earlier that I thought Hasbro had a horrible showing this year with no re no redeeming values whatsoever, but even as me not being a huge Marvel collector, their Marvel showing was fantastic. Yeah. I mean, they showed a, a Dr. Bruce Banner figure. Yeah. Um, that's an Amazon. lots of great stuff in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yeah, that Bruce, that Bruce Banner figure is very like Mark Ruffalo spot on, but I think it's going to be an Amazon exclusive. So Hasbro shows up one more time on my list. So all right, Jerry, okay. wh what's your number nine? My number nine is you know, like I said, there, there's there's two movies that always fight for my attention, or as as the number one spot on my list. Hey, it's you. I'm sorry. I had a sneeze coming on there. Ghostbusters and? And Raiders of the Lost Ark. Ghostbusters is on my number nine. Diamond Select is releasing a series of Ghostbuster figures. So far, they have only shown uh, Winston Zedmore and Ray Stance. But these are really nice looking. Oh, yes. There, there's a couple nitpicks. There's a couple nitpicks I've seen people have that are, you know, some inaccuracies from the films. But these absolutely blow what Mattel did a few years ago out of the water. Um, I only own about two or three of the Mattel figures. After I started buying them, I just realized I didn't think they were good. The sculpts weren't great. 
Um, everything just felt like it was done to be as cheap as possible. These Diamond Select figures look good, and I'm always happy. Diamond Select for me is like NECA. They're one of those companies that even if I don't care about the, the, the property or the character, I'm really interested to see their figures because I think they just do a good job with them. They put a lot of time and effort into them. Uh, the quality's always there. And these Ghostbusters figures look really good. This is the set of the four Ghostbusters that I want to have on my shelf. I mean, this this sculpt is out of the park, even for a company like Diamond Select. They got, uh, you know, Dan Aykroyd's likeness down and uh, Ernie Hudson's likeness down to a T. This is pretty good. I have a few nitpicks with with. with Ernie Hudson's likeness, but overall, but, I mean, it's definitely him. But you know, for a $30, $25, $28 dollar figure, I mean, I don't think you can really complain too much. They're, they're usually about, yeah, Diamond Select stuff usually is about twenty four ninety nine most of the time. Yeah, I mean, you're not paying for like a hot toy or a sideshow product here. So I like those figures. They, they almost made my list. My number nine, I'm going to go back to Hasbro and Marvel. All right, it is a Ant-Man figure. It is a figure that has the very tiny Ant-Man and the giant ant. And it looks like that this is just going to be something you can grab like at Target or Walmart probably for like 25 bucks. But it's just a it's an innovative figure, you know, just to kind of put that unique packaging on the shelf that won't be hanging on a peg that will actually be sitting on a shelf kind of like the deluxe uh lands not the land speeder, but the uh, the scout trooper, the speeder bike, the speeder yeah. bike that you saw from Star Wars Black. Uh, you know, it would have just been easy never to make this figure, but I admire Hasbro for making this figure. I'm not sure the sculpt on the figure that little because it is a mini Ant Man will be a home run, but I just admire the kind of innovation with that one. It seems like a cool thing. Just you know, if you just liked Ant Man, if you like Ant Man. You know, you may not collect anything else Marvel, but it's just one of those cool things to have sitting on a shelf somewhere. I agree. You know, I just agree. kind of a neat little thing that would catch somebody's eye or if you want to fiddle around with it while podcasting, you know, or, or something like that. That, that absolutely. So. All right, Jerry, let's get to your number eight. My number eight is from the Playmates Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles line, and this is one that... I, I, you know, if you watch their uh, the walkthrough with Playmates with Pixel Dan, um, yeah, they, they talk about that this is probably coming. He's been teased before, but this seems to be a more legit. It's a little three pack of figures. Um, one of them is a chicken, which I don't recognize the chicken yet, but I'm a little behind in watching TMNT. I'm, I'm watching them on the DVDs as they're released. But the other two figures in the pack are Spike. Raf, you know, Raphael's turtle that turns into Slash, and Ice Cream Kitty. Yeah. So it's a it's a little miniature figure of the Ice Cream Kitty, and I like the Ice Cream Kitty. He's so weird, and the fact that you know Michelangelo just loves him and 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 occasionally you know licks him because he's tasty. Uh, I'm I'm loving the TMNT cartoon series right now by Nickelodeon. Yeah. Last night, my wife and I were watching. We were watching it after putting the little one to bed again. And, uh, gosh, I mean, I was sitting there almost thinking this might be my favorite Turtles, you know, universe incarnation that I've ever seen. For me, it's... I'm a big fan of the first movie. Yeah, it's the first... TMNT, but The first I'm movie the show. Are, are that cart, the comic book by IDW... And yeah, that, that's good, too. Those are kind of the three best versions. The chicken character actually is the uh, mage from the Dungeons & Dragons episode that they have, uh, the role-playing episode in TMNT. Have you seen that episode? I just, I just watched that. Now, there's an owl. There's Sir Malachi the owl, oh, but this is actually was. Like, a chick, like a little chicken. Okay, then I hadn't seen that. I'm... I think I'm 12 episodes behind. I'm pretty caught up, but it might be something fairly new, or it could have been just a one-off joke in a in an episode that I'm forgetting. Okay, well, my number eight. Let's go to Lego. Now, I'm not a Lego fan, but Lego. I had two products that caught my eye this year, 
And one is the uh, Ultimate Collector Series TIE Fighter. Uh, 1600 over 1600 pieces. I think it's going to be about 200 bucks is what it's going to retail for. And I'm an admirer of Lego fans. And I'm an admirer of somebody who has the patience to put these, uh, let's just say, sometimes tedious products together like Barbecue 17 does. But, well, I don't uh, think ever putting Legos together are tedious. They're really fun. But to sit there and and to have a product catch my eye that makes me really want to wander down that Lego aisle at Toys R Us, which I cannot afford to do, especially for two hundred bucks, uh, <laughs> that that's kind of a standout product. And I mean, you can look in the cockpit here. You can see the little Lego Tie Fighter. I mean. It's extremely detailed, right up there with some of the best Star Wars uh, Lego stuff that they've done. What did you think of this TIE Fighter? Did you get a chance to see it? Yeah, it's really nice. Lego Lego is doing a great job getting out uh, Star Wars product, original trilogy product, Clone Wars product. They've even released, uh, I mean, they've got tons of Rebel stuff out there, but they've even got some expanded universe, like former expanded universe stuff out there. Like the Shadow Troopers and things. Yeah. So Lego is killing it. So take, Lego's doing a great job. Take notes, Hasbro. Take notes. All right. Let's go to, uh, we're on number seven, Jerry. What's your number seven? My number seven is the Rocketeer from Funko's Legacy line. So Funko's Legacy is their uh, six, their six inch really articulated line kind of like their Game of Thrones line or their Magic the Gathering line from last year. So these are kind of like Star Wars Black. You know, they come in boxes, but they have a Rocketeer figure coming out. And I'm a big Rocketeer fan. Um, I actually had a bendable Rocketeer as a kid and loved that thing. And this is a really nice articulated Rocketeer. He's got an alternate, you know, unhelmeted portrait that, um, you know, kind of looks like Cliff's Accord. From the film, he's got the the Mauser pistol that he uses, uh, his jetpack. Just a really cool figure that I'm really excited about. And I'm a big Rocketeer fan. For some reason, whenever I see movies like uh, Rocketeer brought up on TV, and it's not a movie like Ninja Turtles or Power Rangers or one of the Batman films that I have a close tie to, I always remember the fast food tie-in. I think Pizza Hut had a Rocketeer fast food tie-in, if I remember correctly. I don't, rem- I don't remember <laughs> that. But I remember yeah. the Rocketeer being huge, and yeah. I liked the character, had the toy, did not see the movie until a few months ago. Oh, my God. Yeah, I saw it as a, I think it was like 94 or 93. Yeah. It was early 90s, but I like Rocketeer. All right, my, I num- am my number seven. Love we love Rocketeer, but my number seven is Back to Lego. I have Back to Back Lego products. My seven is the Lego Ant-Man. I just saw it described as the most appropriately sized Lego figure ever. So <laughs> I think that's enough said about that. I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing what they do with Ant Man and they have a figure uh, very similar to the um one that Hasbro's doing with the giant ant and then the Lego sized uh Paul Rudd Ant Man. So I actually if that was like twenty bucks or a reasonable price, thirty bucks, I may uh, pick it up just to have. I want some Lego stuff, but I'm afraid to go down Pandora's box there with that, you know? Kind of into the rabbit hole, if you will. But, um, did you it's see easy that? To do uh, that with Lego stuff. Yeah, it's easy to. Did you see that, uh, Lego Ant Man? Did you get a chance to see him? I did. I did look at a lot of the Lego, uh, Ant Man and Avenger stuff, and they've got some great, I mean, they've got some really cool stuff coming out. I like the, uh, I like the Avengers Tower. Yeah, they're hit. Or did you see the Hell Carrier too? It's like three hundred fifty dollars. It's like over yeah, three thousand pieces. That is a massive. I think that's up there with the dang Death Star as far as Lego scope and size. But that yeah. was just too much for me, so it didn't make my list. All right, let's get to number six, Jerry. What's your number six? All right. Well, I've been I've been a pretty big fan of the uh, like the throwback action figures that kind of. Uh, you know, pay homage to the old Kenner figures, you know. And I guess I should say um, I didn't include Funko Reactions 
Big Trouble in Little China line because they showed that a few weeks ago. Yeah. So Otherwise, that would have been high up there because Big Trouble in Little China is one of my favorite movies. Definitely in my top ten. But for number six was a line that was new. We knew they were doing it. We hadn't seen the figures yet. And it is Funko Reactions, The Fifth Element. Oh, yes. There have yes. never been Fifth Element action figures before. There was a company that... Uh, teased them back in, like, the late 90s, but they never came to fruition. So now we have a really cool Kenner-inspired, you know, Corbin Dallas, two versions of Lilu, the, you know, the blue who's singing Alien, um, Gary Oldman's character, um, Chris Tucker's character from the film, the DJ and TV host. So they look really good. They have that reaction style that, you know, some people really like and some people just don't care for it. Uh, I'm a really big fan of it, though. Reaction had a good showing, I will say. Uh, they've got a taxi driver figure coming out, you know, which from the movie with uh, De Niro, which seems kind of cool that they're doing that. And I think your significant other will be very happy. There is a Jaws reaction line coming out. Yeah, I was just going to say it's number one on Abby's Toy Fair list is the Jaws Funko reaction line. I showed her those figures, and she went kind of nuts. She actually wants to buy them. For those of you that don't know, my wife's all-time favorite movie is Jaws. We have a very expensive Mondo poster in our living room from Jaws. By Martin Anson, but I'm excited for those Jaws figures myself, too. Yeah, they look good. I really know, I know I do want Bruce the Shark. Okay, so that's your number six, Funko Reaction. Fifth Element, Fifth element right? My yep. number six is going to go to uh, Mattel, and we are going to go to the, I'm not still in one that you may have on your list later. Mine is the Bat Computer. Uh, set with the alternate uh, Adam West head sculpt. I had oh, all number these... Number 11 on my list. That's number 11, so it just missed your list. I uh, invested uh, deeply into this line. I had all these figures, and I ended up uh, selling off a lot of my, I won't say lower end, but kind of my Mattel stuff that wasn't Sideshow or Hot Toys as I look around. When we put a down payment down on our house, I ended up selling a lot of those figures. So it's not a line I'll be getting into again, but to have a playset of the back computer with the Adam West head sculpt, I just thought... Shakespeare bust? Yeah, for a line that you thought may have been dead, to bounce back with that, I thought that was pretty good. What'd you think of they, that they've product? Shown, they've shown that Batgirl figure. She's been She's been shown in a couple shows. Um, if she hadn't been shown before, she would be very high up on my list because I've always wanted, you know, an Yvonne Craig Batgirl. Um, but, the, yeah, that set was on there. Uh, looks like maybe a single pack, uh, well, a three pack of Batgirl, Batman, and Robin, which is disappointing because I already have a regular Batman. So, I don't know. We'll see what happens. But um, it's interesting to see that there's still a little bit of life in that line. I think that line should have, you know, been handled a lot better, but I can say that about a lot of Mattel products, so good choice, though. All right, so now we're getting into the top five, Jerry. What was your number five? My number five was the Ellen Ripley figure from NECA that is from Aliens. So this is the Aliens Ripley. She's got the... You know, the combination pulse rifle flamethrower weapon that has been taped together, you know, from near the uh, climax of that film. And just a really good looking figure. I mean, ever since NECA started doing Aliens figures, actually ever since McFarlane started doing Aliens figures, you know, in the late 90s as part of the cult, uh, sorry, the movie Maniacs line, Ripley has always been the figure that everybody's wanted. And now we've got a couple Ripley's coming out, but Ripley from Aliens is without a doubt the the figure that I've always wanted. Okay, so I'm going to go to my number five, and we don't need to say a whole lot about it, but it is that Jaws Funko reaction line. That is number five. I've already said it. Any uh, action figure line that can get my wife interested in uh, action figures and their products, that's making my top five. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I really tried that. So one line that didn't make my list, but that I really have been trying to show to my wife to get her excited, is uh, 
Diamond Select is doing Nightmare Before Christmas mini mains. Oh wow! They yeah. look great. I mean, they look fantastic. Um, I have pretty much most of the Ghostbuster mini mates, and then I have a couple others. Like I have the Expendables mini mates and a few random ones here and there. But these Nightmare Before Christmas ones look awesome. So I, I hear what you're saying. Trying to, you know, if you can get the wife wanting to buy a toy, that's an exciting thing. Uh, Andrew Stokes is the big Minnie Mates collector, so he has Yeah, he does have a lot of the Marvel ones. He yeah. needs to catch up, though. He's behind. All right, let's get to uh, our top four. Number four, Jerry, what is yours? Mine is the uh, DC Collectibles, a, a reveal at the show. It is a Batmobile from Batman the Animated Series that will hold two six-inch action figures. Yes. It's, it's gorgeous. It, is. It, it has lights, it holds two figures, and it's going to retail for under $100, which I think is pretty incredible. No, it's considering how like aesthetically pleasing, how slick, how crisp the molding is, the lights, that it can house two highly articulated six-inch figures from the line. Yeah. Wow, I, I was blown away. That may be appearing on my list uh, here very soon. I am I am so excited about... Uh, DC Collectibles won the show for me. Let me say it. They won Toy Fair uh, flat out, uh, as you'll see coming up. But I'll echo that because my top four are all DC Collectibles. Their Batman animated line just is, is really good. I have Batman so far. I plan on getting all of them. I know there's been some quality control issues with that line early on, but DC is, they're addressing it. They've went into very technical details about how they're fixing it. They've delayed product to fix it. And I just think, I think the Batman animated line is going to be the next kind of it line. It's going to be the next, you know, Marvel Legends, DC Universe Classics, Star Wars Vintage Collection, uh, Masters Universe Classics. It's going to be that next line that everybody is collecting. It's a good line for DC collectibles to kind of fill the void that's going to be left over once the Arkham video games wrapped. I know they got a lot of Arkham video game stuff for Arkham Knight, but once that wraps up to kind of... Because you can keep going endlessly with that line. I mean, there's fans like us that would like every side character, right? I mean, I mean, they're making Roxy Rocket. I've already got it. I've already got everything from that line pre-ordered. Exactly. I'm excited. Alright, so I'm my excited. number four is uh, DC Collectibles. Again, will all be in my top four. Uh, they're two of the 12-inch statues. For those that have followed my collecting habits closely, which I know is a lot of our readers out there, I'm kind of... Movie. Buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell. Buy and sell. I do buy and sell a lot, but I've, I've managed to keep a hold of my statues and hot toys, like 12-inch uh, type or more figures. And, uh, you know, I've never been a fan of uh, DC Collectibles, kind of the 12-inch statues that they did for the Dark Knight Rises and stuff. I just thought their quality was uh, lacking. Their movie stuff has not traditionally been that great. No, no. Uh, and But I saw two 12-inch statues, and I'm only going to pick one here because I absolutely adore this show. Me and you was talking about earlier this week, and I really want to pick it up. We'll see if the budget allows. But I, had, I have to say, Jerry, if I was only going to pick up one thing on my entire list, this is the one I'm most likely to buy. It is the 12-inch... Uh, statue for CW's The Flash. I love this show. It's made me become a huge Flash fan. It balances kind of the young people romance and growing up type angle with the superhero element so perfectly. Better than any Spider-Man movie has done since Spider-Man 2. I love it. I want to pick up the DC Collectibles 12 inch Flash. And I think a lot of people will because they did one for uh, Arrow and there were two versions, a hooded and an unhooded one. The unhooded one sculpt was off. The hooded one looked amazing. I was going to pick it up. I didn't. It retailed for $112. It's now going for five to 600 on eBay. Wow. Exactly. So, And this sculpt looks dead on like the Grant Gustin Flash. 
So if I can pick up one thing on this list, this would probably be it. They also revealed right beside it uh, a Jim Gordon uh, Gotham figure that looks just like the younger version of Jim Gordon uh, based on uh, the guy who played Ryan Atwood on the OC. His name's escaping me. Uh, Benjamin McKenzie, based on Benjamin McKenzie's portrayal of Jim Gordon and Gotham. And I've watched Gotham. It gets progressively better. Um, I need to catch up. But yeah, my number four would be that Flash and Jim Gordon statue with the Flash etching it out. But uh, let's get to our three, top three, Jerry. What is third on your list? Number three of mine is not a specific figure. or um, It's actually from Masters of the Universe Classics. Uh, they had a pretty good showing. This was the first Toy Fair uh, for Master, Masters of the Universe Classics without uh, Scott Knightlick, who was the brand manager for years. They actually had uh, some of the four horsemen were there, um, you know, showing off the figures. But it's been rumored for a while, but we finally got confirmation. Uh, Mattel is doing a Masters of the Universe, Masters of the Universe Classics uh, sub-subscription, that is based on the 2000 TV series. So it's having some characters that were specifically from that show. Uh, the uh, uh, 2000 version of Evil Seed, who was originally a Filmation character. Uh, Siritus, who was a Caligar, kind of like Whiplash. And they're also doing a head pack, which are uh, 2000 styled heads for some of the characters they've already released in the line. So it's going to be a six-figure subscription with a bonus item of the head pack, and it's going to be uh, going on sale next week, and I think the first subscription figure will come out in July. So really excited. Um, it's an extra six figures and a head pack on top of what you know is already coming out for that line that you know that just keeps continuing to grow. It's my favorite line to collect, and... Honestly, it's probably in my top three or five action figure lines of all time. Uh, my number three goes back again to DC Collectibles. It is what they're doing with their Arrow line. They're making Arsenal the Red Arrow. And only leave it to DC Collectibles to be the only people who can pull off these type of action figures. They're making a John Diggle action figure and a... Yeah, Felicity Smoke action figure. So they now, look really good. And they look really good, the sculpting for a six-inch figure. Uh, they get the likenesses from the show spot on. Now you can kind of complete your uh, green arrow cave that they have in the basement of the Verdant uh, nightclub if you watch Arrow. So a lot of fans have loved this line, the, the Dark Archer, Malcolm Merlin. They've had... Um, you know, uh, different versions of the era. They've had Deathstroke. So uh, that's a line that I, I really admire from afar. And uh, it's cool to see uh, DC Collectibles kind of give the fans what they want because uh, that CW era show does have a very, for a show that's not on network TV, ABC, NBC, Fox, or CBS, it has a pretty ravenous fan base. So I, I'm excited for that. And the Arsenal figure just looks dead on like Roy Harper. So, Jerry, what's your number two? All right. Well, we talked about NECA doing those ultimate versions of action figures earlier. Uh, it's, a great, you know, it's a great opportunity for them to do a figure that maybe can't sustain a whole line, but to get you know, a really great version out. And this is probably the, like, well, this is the, the figure that, you know, made me scream the second most seeing it at uh, Toy Fair. It is NECA's ultimate John Matrix from Commando. Arnold Schwarzenegger from the film Commando. I was super excited. NECA has done Terminator. They've done Rambo. They've done, you know, Predator. Uh, they've got Ellen Ripley coming out. They've got all these great, you know, 80s action icons. And now we're getting Schwarzenegger from Commando. For those I of you pumped. who don't know, when you walk into Barbecue 17's house, you go into his dining room, and right next to his nice dining room table, he has a glass case that has something his wife loves from pop culture, Nightmare Before Christmas. 
then things that he loves from pop culture, and it's like an 80s kind of NECA collection with Predator, Robocop, Alien, those type of things, and that's going to go perfect in that shelf. That's the first thing that I thought beautiful of. beautiful there. Yeah, it will. So it's good to see him kind of round out the Arnold Schwarzenegger. Now we need a... Uh, now they may have done this. I'm not a NECA expert. Have they done a last action hero figure? They have not. That's next. So I'm, that's my hope for to- a Toy Fair 2016, okay? So I really want him from Jingle All the Way. Yeah, that would be a pipe dream there. All right. Number one, Jerry. Or, no, are we on number You're one? You're number two. You're number, number two. two. Number two, excuse me. Go back to the Batman the Animated Series line. I have a tie. Because it's two of my favorite characters specifically from that incarnation of the show. And one that I thought there would never be an action figure line. And if you remember when we were discussing this line last year, this is one of the figures I said I wanted. The Phantasm. Yes. I think he's going to be in a two-pack with the alternate kind of Batman. But I love Mask of the Phantasm, one of my favorite Batman movies. You know, it's definitely better than either of the Schumacher films. Uh, it came out like, what, Christmas 1993 or something like that? I think that's correct. Yeah, I remember my yeah. mom taking me to see it in the winter. So yeah, sometimes. I went too as a kid, and I watched this movie over and over and over. It's just a great Joker story, a great Bruce Wayne story. And a lot of other twists and turns that I'm not going to spoil in case you hadn't seen it. But to get a Phantasm figure. Please don't, please don't spoil the 20 plus year old movie for us, Brad. I won't. I won't. Alright. Now, I have a tie, so I'm kind of cheating. Uh, it's okay. Mad Hatter. To have the Jer- Is it Jervis Tetch or Tech? Uh, Jervis Tetch, I believe. I'm never, I'm not a huge, huge uh, fan of the Mad Hatter villain from the comic books, but I absolutely adore the Mad Hatter villain from uh, Batman the Animated Series. That version of the character to me. Is this the, one's the new Batman Adventures one, right? No, no, no. This is the Batman the Animated Series one. All right, the okay. taller one, the blue coat, the blonde hair, the tall top hat. Uh, one of my favorite one episodes is his first appearance in Batman the Animated Series. To me, they did such a good job with that character uh, on that show that Mad Hatter was even more compelling than, uh, say, the Penguin or the Riddler on that show for me. So uh, I'm, I would never say that in overall Batman context, but I've always... I had the action figure of this when I was a kid. So to see that come in this collectible line, I'm really excited for a Mad Hatter figure. So now, here we are, number one. Now, Jerry, I'm going to go first, okay? Okay. Okay, and then, so we're going to switch it up, because you've already said my number one, and we've discussed it a little bit. Um, My number one is the Batman, the animated series, Batmobile. To get a Batmobile that slick, that many details, we've said it already, for 85 bucks, about a 24-inch Batmobile, unprecedented. So, DC Collectibles, Batman the Animated uh, Series Batmobile gets my number one for Toy Fair 2015, just for making that affordable and high quality for their fans. (coughs) All right, Jerry, your number one of Toy Fair 2015. All right. There are always action figures that you just don't think you're ever going to see. A lot of times it's characters from a really popular property but done in a different way. Um, This is not my number one, but it was really cool that DC Collectibles showed a, a Bruce Wayne action figure, which is Bruce Wayne in a suit. We've had, you know, Batman figures without the cowl on before. We've had, you know... Batman figures where you, you know, you put the armor on Bruce Wayne, but there never was a really dedicated Bruce Wayne figure who was in, you know, a regular suit or something. That was pretty exciting to see. My number one is a three-pack from DC Collectibles from the video game Arkham Origins. In that game, there's a group of assassins that are sent after Batman, And um, DC Collectibles has done every one of those assassins now, except for two of them. This three-pack completes that series 
and gives gives us one more figure that put this at number one on my list. It has Lady Shiva in it. Lady Shiva has never had an action figure before. She's an important part of the Batman mythos. It has Electrocutioner with it, you know. What an Not a great character, but he figures, you know, he, he, he completes that, uh, the, the assassins from Arkham Origins. But number one is a Dr. Harleen Quinzel action figure. Harley Quinn, before she becomes Harley Quinn, when she was a psychiatrist at um, at Arkham Asylum. It is an awesome-looking figure. It is a figure I never thought in my life that I would see. Harley Quinn is, without a doubt, just one of the best Batman characters out there. There's a lot of depth to the character. There's a lot of fun to the character. She's got an interesting background story. She's related you know, to a lot of the other characters in a way. And I was just amazed by this three pack. I am. This is the number one thing I'm looking forward to. You have so many people like you, Jared, that collect one character. Like uh, specifically, you try to get everything from that character. Yours is Batgirl. For yes. so many people, it's Harley Quinn. And for a character that new to have that big of a following, and they've been so much overflow of Harley Quinn product. It's kind of hard to get something different or original in there, and DC Collectibles did that with that Harleen Quinzel figure. So I, it didn't make my list, but it's definitely you know uh, up there. So all right, that's our top ten. Are there any closing thoughts on Toy Fair before we wrap up? I mean, there was just so much good stuff there that I was really interested in. Um, like I said, I mean, Diamond, you know, showed off a couple Batgirl statues that they're putting out, one based on the 66 series, one on the animated. I mentioned the uh, Night Before Christmas Mini Mates. Um, DC's got a great – Collectibles has got a great line of six-inch scale, really articulated figures with great accessories called DC Comics Icons. The Flash has his treadmill – uh, they just look awesome. There's a Jim Lee hush there. This was just a really good toy fair. A lot of really great collector-oriented stuff. And I think we're really seeing the market split. That, you know what, Mattel didn't release any, anything DC that I was like, except for teasing a couple of those 66 figures. But DC collectibles going right to collectors, you know, through the places that they uh, they sell through. I mean, they just had their finger on the pulse of what, you know, fans wanted, and they seem to have no limits, which is really exciting. Yeah, my only disappointment besides the lack of Star Wars stuff from Hasbro was that we really didn't see anything from Bandai, uh, Power Rangers related, as far as the legacy line moving forward. That line is not sold well in spots, so I'm wondering... Uh, what's going to happen to it after they release Saba and the Tiger Zord here in 2015? Have you seen the movie Morpher? Yeah, I have. I saw it at Toys R Us. It looks yeah, okay. Yeah, I saw the other week, too. It looks just a little kind of plain to me. I don't know. Yeah. I didn't like it as much as I did the Green Ranger or the one that you have that has the five in there. So, yeah, the original uh, Morpher. Hopefully that line's not dead. Hopefully it can come back next year surprise us like 66 batman did for mattel this year i'd just like to see some really good figures in that line there's not been any figures that i've thought that you know the action figures themselves haven't been great the no. prop replicas have but the figures themselves have been pretty lackluster the zords and uh like you said the the weapon props have been good they need to kind of shift the focus of that line toward the figures and maybe go They've released the triangle boxes, but they've been about five inch weird scale figures. Maybe they need to go to like a more traditional six, six and a half inch scale and uh, beef up that packaging and well, accessories. And, and the original figures were pretty large, and, and that's one of the old, the things that you know I've heard people talk about when you're doing a when you're redoing a vintage toy line. A lot of the time, you know, unless you're going for a straight up homage, one of the things you do is actually make the figure a little bit larger. Like the Masters of the Universe figures. Yeah. They're bigger than your average figure because the original Masters of the Universe figures were bigger than your average Star Wars or G.I. Joe figure. So when you open it as an adult, you're still like, wow, this is a really, you know, chunky, beefy figure. And yeah. the Power Ranger figures were, were pretty large. They were I mean, they about were about eight inches. Yeah, about eight inches. So they maybe need to go for something eight to nine inches to really give 
adult collectors that had him as kids kind of, you know, give them some oomph to him. All right, Jerry Reed, that's going to wrap up episode 37 of the Confirmed Epic Podcast. Where can we find more of you? Keep checking me out at actionfigurebarbecue.blogspot.com, right. where I'm putting up hot and fresh reviews every day. And hopefully he'll be writing some things for the epicreview.com here soon, too. Hopefully. All right, and as for me, I've been trying to keep up to date on the epicreview.com. Visit me there. You'll find the podcast there. It is the official home of the podcast. You can find me on Twitter at the Real Brad Bell. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at the Real Brad Bell. And I have been uh, going back to updating our Facebook pages, facebook.com slash epicreview, and updating our Twitter feed, which a lot of you follow us on Twitter at the TH Epic Review. Dot com. So until next time, from the Hollywood foothills of North Carolina, we are out.